I made a video recently about how the glutes contribute to deadlift lockouts and what to do if they're weak or lagging. Because let's face it, if you spend all this time squatting and deadlifting and your ass isn't filling out your jeans, you're doing something wrong. After that video, I got a bunch of questions about how to fix issues off the floor. So we're gonna get to the bottom of that. Real quick, I wanna give a shout out to Boost Camp, who is now a primary sponsor of this channel. I've done some work with them over the last year. They're an absolutely great product. They've worked with exceptional figures in the community like Greg Knuckles, Eric Helms, Bryce Lewis, and I'm happy now to be part of that team. It's absolutely free to use. It's super convenient. You can go look through their library of programs, find one that suits your goals, punch in your numbers and go to town. I have a few free ones up there, Kong, Bull Mastiff, along with Full Sturker, which is a premium paid program. Thanks again to Boost Camp. Go ahead and check them out in the link below. But for right now, it's story time. You walk up to the deadlift bar, anxious and jittery from the pre-workout low carb monster slurry you just pounded. The sound of your favorite emo band from 2003 is blaring into your ears and you spent the last 10 minutes thinking about your first girlfriend and how she dumped you two days before prom. Adrenaline's turning your face red hot and you're vibrating with pure unfiltered animosity. The gym members stare on wondering, What's his deal about the lunatic who's pacing back and forth, hyperventilating and making a scene in the free weight area? The bar is loaded with more weight than you've ever lifted, and you know that your place at the grown-up table depends entirely on your ability to lift it. Well, you aren't drinking Martinelli's at the plastic kitty table this Thanksgiving. You're here to get your first sip of dad's aged scotch and listen to your uncles talk about mutual funds. Approaching the bar, you howl and clap your hands together, releasing a thundercloud of chalk. You aren't being clean, you aren't being quiet, and everyone is watching. You're here to prove something to each of them. You're here to prove it to your training partner who thinks your total is cute. You're here to prove it to the boot camp instructor you're crushing on. You're here to prove it to Ivan, the professional bodybuilder who's jacked to the tits, drives a Lambo, and is dating the 28-year-old front desk girl. So, deciding at that moment that the pain of failure is greater than the physical pain, you decide to commit. You turn up dashboard confessional, clamp your belt down, and whisper your ex's name one more time. Becky. It's go time. You lurch down to the bar, hooking your hands into it and heaving with every bit of your angry, insecure being. The bar flexes under your effort. Your hips begin to rise, folding your spine like a cheap coat hanger. Your legs shake, your veins swell, your teeth crack, but the bar stays put. You miss the lift in front of everyone. You worthless, pathetic loser. No wonder Becky took your best friend to the prom instead of you. Todd would have finished that lift. Now there's nothing left to do but throw your gym bag in the dumpster and drive north as far away from the Rancho Cucamonga 24-hour fitness as you can get. Now, in reality, this is just a grandiose story we tell ourselves to build a sense of urgency in our workouts. If we think our lifts matter to anyone else or that something is actually at stake in our workouts, we put out greater effort and get more out of our training. In reality, you're crushing could give a flying rat fuck what your best lifts are. No one was watching you except to fantasize about telling you to shut the fuck up. And certainly no one was taking notes. But the missed lift is still of concern. Your therapist can spend time getting to the root of your toxic obsession with PRs or why a grown man spends 15 hours per week in the gym. That's not what I'm here for. If you're going to bother putting in the time, my only concern is to make sure that you aren't wasting it. So let's break this thing down. Why did you miss the lift? Your first instinct is going to be to say that you misgrooved it, that your grip wasn't quite right, or that someone walked between you and your camera while you were about to lift, distracting you beyond any possible hope of recovery. That is, of course, horseshit. The first action of a bruised ego is to rationalize away a failure. Something to the effect of, I could have gotten it, but... Even if that was true, which it never is, you don't get points for potential. You are not your potential, your hopes, your dreams, your best intentions. You are what you do, and what you are not is someone who lifted the fucking weight. The easy and mostly correct answer to why you missed it is that it was just too damn heavy. Okay, okay, you think, defense mechanisms aside, something is still amiss. I pulled 10 pounds less than that for three reps, but this I couldn't even break off the ground. Put the bar mid shin and I'll pull it for 10. Now that's an interesting point. Your work sets done for reps suggest a much higher one rep max than you are capable of. You're able to demonstrate much more strength in subtly different positions, and the weight doesn't really feel heavy to you. In fact, it glides past your knee to lockout with relative ease. It's just at that one bitch of a spot right off the ground you feel weak, exposed, and without a handle to grab onto. The strength is there somewhere behind this obstacle, hiding. You know that if you just figure out this one pain in the ass stick point, you'll climb over this brick wall and find nothing but PRs and blue skies ahead. Well, my eager deadlift enthusiast, let me put on my fake lab coat so we can do some science on this bitch. First off, let's make sure the weight is not, in fact, just too heavy. If you are in the habit of pulling a hard grinded max effort single, then throwing on 50 pounds and yoloing into a PR attempt, 
the weight is not going to budge an inch off the ground. This doesn't mean you are weak off the ground. It means you have no self-awareness and need to ground your expectations in real life. I've known people that have done this and swore that if I could just budge it, I know I have it. When in reality, their attempts closer to a true one rep max end up creaking their way up to the mid shin or even the knee area before stalling out. Think about the heaviest weight you've ever pulled in a clean, no bones about it style, then add 10 pounds to that. Where do you miss it? If that 10 pounds is the difference between a full clean rep and the bar not budging an inch, we have something to talk about. In that situation, there are two reasons why you're missing the lift right off the ground. Reason number one is that your top end is much better than your bottom end strength. Duh. This is actually my situation. I can pull much heavier from elevated positions and I never miss a deadlift above the knees. In a hypothetical scenario where I can muster just a little more force right off the ground, my max goes up substantially. This is also the reason I get so much out of a deadlift suit. We can talk about two different sub reasons. Reason 1A being individual muscular weakness, mainly the quads. See, knee extension gives its greatest contribution to the deadlift right off the ground. And beyond that, the hips take over pretty quickly. If you rely on any amount of leg drive to get the bar going and your quads are small and weak, I'm looking at you guys who deadlift 200 pounds more than you squat, they will be the limiting factor in breaking the weight. Now with those leggy lifters who wouldn't know leg drive if it smacked them in the face, you know, the ones with steel cables for erectors who pull with their spine, missing a 10 pound PR off the floor is likely a psychological issue or just fatigue from a previous attempt. If the glutes and hams are strong enough by themselves to carry 500 pounds through the entire range of a deadlift, they are probably strong enough to get 505 off the ground a few inches. Your solution to your current plateau will likely require a different approach than focusing on off the ground strength. To everyone else, don't overthink it. Just get your quads up by increasing the volume of knee extension work you do throughout the week, whether it be leg extension, sled drags, or actual squats. Or you can implement the movements we're gonna talk about next. The second sub issue is issues with patterning. You can look at weak points as a coordination issue and aim to fix it with more work at that particular point. This is generally the preferred method to fixing weak areas because A, it's easier to just look at where the bar sticks and prescribe more work at that point than to try to guess which muscle is lagging and isolate that. And B, it has the effect of strengthening the laggy muscles anyway. Example, bar sticking mid shin, spend more time under tension with the bar mid shin. Remove the momentum you're used to having right at that point and do dead stop work off the pins. Pause on the way up, pause on the way down. Do RDLs or good mornings for tempo. There's plenty of options to increase the stress at that point. But before you start writing every deadlift variation under the sun into your program, ask if you do your reps dead stop or touch and go, bounced. There's nothing wrong with bounced reps as a developmental movement. I prescribe them often myself. But if you love the feeling of clipping off 93% of your max for sets of eight by performing one deadlift and seven bounces, you might be feeding into this weak spot. See, bounce reps exploit stretch reflex, which allows for a faster change of direction for the exact same effort. This actually increases stress on the rest of the movement, but decreases the training effect right off the ground. Imagine if your next powerlifting meet had a squat, but it was to be taken from the bottom up, off the pins. In training for that meet, would you do your first rep that way and then bounce through the other reps? No, and you shouldn't use that as a primary method for your deadlifts either. So the first step is to make sure all of your deadlifts are done from a dead stop. This will do the most to condition a strong, consistent break off the floor. Beyond that, the solution to a weak start has historically been prescribed as deficit work. A trick of the powerlifting old timers was to do all of their deadlift work standing on two inch mats, using smaller plates, or wearing work boots, instead of using deficit pulls as a standalone variation after their regular deadlift work. After a few weeks of this, standard height feels like cheating. I also like to recommend stiffer bars, since whippy ones give you more time to reach maximal force production. During the period of time where they flex, before the weight breaks, you are recruiting more and more units until you're firing at 11 and the flex in the bar has allowed for a stronger position anyways. Use a stiff bar or better yet an axle and feel how much more work is required to get the bar moving. That is the training stress you are looking for to build a lightning quick start. I'm also a big fan of trap bar deadlifts to solve this issue. The nature of the bar being out of the way means you can scoop your hips and knees forward earlier and this turns the movement to more of like an upright leg press movement. There are just few movements that condition a nasty leg drive into the bar as good as trap bar deadlifts. Deadlifts. Now, heavy ass reps on the high handles are fun and they do have value. They'll definitely teach you leg drive. But if this is specifically to target your strength off the ground with a barbell, I would suck it up and use the low handles more often than not. Load is going to be a lot lower at first, so use it after your main pulls or on a different day. By the time you can low trap bar deadlift more than you can pull on a straight bar, you can be assured that your starting power will be immensely improved. The last recommendation I can give for a training exercise is, and it pains me to say this, box squats. 
I pushed back against these as a trendy exercise that was just trying to reinvent the wheel. But after years of dicking around with different things, I have to admit it works pretty damn well if you apply it right. I use these to get work in during one of my early back injuries. Deadlifting and squatting caused immense pain, but box squats with a wider stance slightly above parallel felt great. I spent the next six weeks pushing these until I finally decided to start rebuilding my deadlift. After that time, having not deadlifted for so long, my strength off the ground was absolutely insane. You can probably argue that really heavy work with a leg press sled or a belt squat would do something similar, and I wouldn't disagree, but building deadlift strength off the ground just feels like it should be done holistically. Having to break from a dead stop while supporting a loaded bar at the end of your torso makes sure that whatever strength your legs and hips gain can be handled throughout the whole body and will actually transfer onto your deadlift. I don't recommend a narrow stance, nor do I condone the silly five foot wide stance with the feet pointed perfectly east and west. Take a medium stance and maybe walk your feet out an inch or two on either side. The big thing here is making sure you don't rock or bounce off the bottom. We want to condition reversing direction from a pure dead stop. So make sure you kick your ass back, load into your hips, let the box take your full weight, then drive through your heels and leap off the box. Try to crank up your starting speed as much as possible. Imagine your hips are being stretched back on the way down, like the rubber band of a slingshot ready to commit a misdemeanor. Then just let them fly. Again, these shouldn't replace the deadlift, but they are damn effective if done after deads or on a different day. Reason number two, you're weak off the ground, you're just scared to pull. This is also my situation. I've had a run of back injuries over the last 15 years that left my deadlift hanging on by a thread. I was consistently pulling hurt, and even when I felt good, I was terrified of re-aggravating my injuries. My deadlift sessions were extremely volatile, alternating between days where I felt rigid and powerful where the weight would just leap off the ground, and days where I would turn the key and nothing would happen. With no real understanding of how things worked or what got a good result, I would fall back to superstitious rituals and hope for the best. I would twist my feet that way, shimmy my hips this way, take two quick breaths, no three, grab the bar, and then I would wait. For years, I felt like a desperate prehistoric native during a drought with no option other than to do a rain dance. I guess I thought I was being thorough and taking the extra time to set up at the bottom, but in reality, I was stalling. I guess I had convinced myself that all that extra time spent setting up was just me being thorough, but in reality, I was stalling, hesitating, and this is the absolute worst thing you can do at the start of a deadlift. If you get completely primal and pull away with reckless abandon, at least your supportive musculature benefit from the adrenaline-fueled surge of aggression. It's not great long-term if you're suffering from a dodgy back, but it's certainly better than half committing to a pull where you burn up all of your motivation by second-guessing yourself and then pull away anyways. It seemed like my weakness was from lack of comfort in that position, lack of security through my spine, lack of drive through my hips, lack of knowing what the hell I was doing. Every pull felt different, and that was really the core of the problem. The truth was that I made that a problem because I had trained myself to never expect the same thing twice from my deadlift. I didn't commit to one stance, one set of rules, one psychological approach. Because I saw my woes as being some mysterious, intangible thing, and because I was constantly jumping into different contest preps, I was desperately reaching out to any trick or tweak that might be the shortcut to a competitive deadlift. That chaos bred insecurity. It was in watching a Dave Tate video about the same subject where he bluntly asked, are you weak off the floor? Or are you just fucking scared to pull? My jaw hung open. I, I, I believe I'm scared, sir. At that point, I had found some relief in my back by A, accruing more time injury-free by not really pulling that much, and B, by working the hell out of my bracing work. My abs were stronger, my posture was better, and I felt healthy for the first time in a long time. So I decided to capitalize on this golden opportunity and retool my deadlift. I did that by taking away any opportunity to hesitate. I ditched the straps, which took time to set up in the bottom, which would kill my aggression and confidence and give me time to second guess. And I traded that for a dive bomb approach that some powerlifters have used successfully. I started with a plate, getting my feet planted and running through my ritual. Glutes tight, ribs down for a neutral spine, a few breaths into my tensed abs, one or two practice hinges to reinforce my kamikaze trajectory, and then dive and snap. Now let me be clear, this would have been disastrous if I didn't first get to the bottom of my chronic injuries. I am not telling you to get over your pain and injury-fueled deadlift fears by just going full berserk mode and swinging for the fences. If routine injuries are a problem, you have to get to the bottom of that. But by robbing myself of the time I would otherwise use to hesitate, I had no choice but to pull as hard and as fast as possible off the ground. 
The end result was my heaviest deadlift without straps or a hitch, a 700 pound conventional pull and prep for nationals a few years back. And if I were to have thrown 10 pounds too much on, I know that the bar still would have leapt past my stick point off the ground. I got a ton of transfer from that to my regular strap pulls off the ground, and I found myself much less likely to whiff at the last minute. Knowing that I could manage such a violent movement with such heavy weights gave me an immense amount of confidence off the ground. And I now know that I can take the time setting up at the bottom with straps to actually put my pull in a better, more confident position instead of working directly against it. So if this is you, if you're afraid to pull from the ground, I recommend doing everything to eliminate the break between your hands getting to the bar and the bar leaving the ground. Find your perfect pulling position, stance, posture, grip, and so on, and practice getting to the bar in reversing direction as quick as possible. It's best done with light weights at first, but most of you will be able to add weight liberally each week until you are right up against your old working weights. So that's my two cents on how to fix your weak deadlift off the ground. For everybody, it's gonna come down to lagging muscles, poor patterning, or just fear. And I find that the fear issue staples more people than anything else. And this is the benefit of consistency. This is why you treat these movements like skill work and don't just pull as heavy and as hard as you can as often as you can. You want to refine good habits. Take your time during your warmups. Find a setup and do that over and over and over again. There's a part of your training in the beginning where you're gonna to have to fidget around to find what's comfortable, but your goal should be to find a steady, staple setup for your deadlift as soon as possible. So let me know what you guys think. What's worked for you in the past? Have you implemented any of these strategies? What happened? Go ahead and leave that in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Till next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.